good afternoon. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, we said this morning if the euro would go down, then the attendance will go up. So we see that uh, the room is uh, overbooked. The euro, because I always thought, uh, well, we are a finance school, so we do corporate finance and we do lots of other things, but we don't do monetary policy or uh, economics. But Duisenberg, of course, the name giver of the school and quite a few people in the audience, including David Marsh, uh, have known him, of course, is dubbed uh, Mr. Euro. And uh, so we are very honored as Duisenberg School to have this, uh, this lecture, this debate uh, on the Euro. And the big question is, can the Euro survive without a political union? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dick. Uh, thank you, Kasper. Um, thank you for the generous introduction. I feel somewhat abashed, and I would like to think that I can meet the uh, high expectations that you have raised. First of all, uh, a word about William Dysonberg. I didn't know him very well, but I did know him reasonably well uh, as a journalist, uh, and also when I moved into the banking area uh, in the mid-1990s, uh, he then went to the EMI and also to the ECB, and on all those occasions, I've found him very, very generous with his time, very modest, very straightforward. I do remember, for instance, when I came to the Netherlands Bank in, must have been the early 1990s, and working for the Financial Times, one always tried to do a lot of different things. I think I was researching some story about drugs uh, in Amsterdam, uh, as one does. Uh, but I also was talking to all the central bankers, so I went along to see Mr. Dysenberg first and had a chat with him in his office. Then I said I was going to the police station afterwards to talk about drugs. And he said, well, I'm going in that direction. I'll give you a lift in my car. Uh, I'd like to talk first of all about why we are in the position that we are in. I do think there's been a huge failure of imagination and also of, of logic by the Germans. And uh, as Dick has said, rightly so, the Germans are uh, one of the principal players in this drama together with the French. They haven't actually thought it all through very well. But I always think it's best to start from first principles. And so if you do think about why we have the single currency, it's clearly a, a journey that started many years ago, some might say in Roman times, certainly you can trace it back to the 19th century, but in its most immediate manifestation in the last 20 or 30 years, there were four principal reasons. It's good just to keep those in mind. One was certainly to complete the single market, to give the European construction uh, of the 1950s um, a, a currency to help trade. And we have to keep that in mind. That was Jacques Delors who put that particular uh, horse into the saddle in the 1980s, long before German unification. Uh, I myself would say you don't need to have a single currency to make a single market work, uh, but I'll leave my prejudices aside. Uh, that was certainly a very strong motivation. Point number two cannot be avoided. Uh, many people, for good and bad reasons, uh, particularly in France, felt that the US dollar deserved to have a rival. There was this talk of the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, particularly in the 1960s. It was Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, not de Gaulle, who invented that particular word. And the idea was that Europe should have its own currency, which would allow us in Europe to borrow at lower interest rates and with less problems than the Germans, sorry, than with the Americans. And so the idea of somehow putting the Americans in their place or setting up a rival, perhaps a benevolent rival, to the American monetary dominance was a thought which was put forward not just for negative or selfish reasons, for, for good monetary reasons as well. Uh, point number three was certainly to drive on the age-old dream of political union. Now, we all know that many leaders, Cole himself said just before the Maastricht Treaty, that a monetary union without political union would not subsist. He said it would be a castle in the air. We all know what the theory was, but clearly political union was not possible uh, before monetary union took place. Uh, the rather pious hope was that monetary union would drive on the forces of political union after the event. The politicians deliberately and conspicuously did put the cart before the horse. So the aim was to drive on a greater degree of political union amongst states which were still very disparate. And the fourth reason cannot be ignored, and it's very germane to the subject today, it was to put the Germans in place. Um, Jacques Attali, the great, uh, rather um, mercurial 
advisor to President Mitterrand, uh, once said to me that the Maastricht Treaty was a very long treaty with about 285 pages with just one aim, to get rid of the DMARC. And that was very, very high up in the minds of particularly the French politicians. And the Germans willingly acquiesced in this because after unification it was thought that Germany had to show to the rest of the world that it was every bit as communautaire, every bit as bound in to the principles and the ideals of Western European cooperation as the old Federal Republic had been. And we still, of course, have a tremendous uh, insolvency problem with Greece. Greece has been allowed to get into a situ situation where it simply doesn't only have liquidity needs, it does have an insolvency problem, which I think is inevitably going to lead to a Greek restructuring probably in a couple of years' time. And why on earth people can't just look that fact in the face and actually accept that, I do not know. There we having the worst of both worlds, because we have Mr. Ackermann, who's clearly his own man, the Swiss head of the Deutsche Bank, who appeared on television, saying that he thought that Greece wouldn't be able to repay its debts. And, and that has to be a view of any bank looking at the sums. Uh, Greece is now taking on another load of debt through the European Union and the IMF. Clearly, it's repaying some debt. But it, it, this is like really giving an alcoholic um, a little drink of whiskey just to tide him on his way. It's not actually going to hold much hope for getting the Greeks off the drug because they're being pumped up with a massive amount of new debt. Clearly, there are conditions and there is now an IMF-style programme underway. I have to say in parenthesis, while I was making a speech in Germany, quite a lot of speeches about my book last year, and I said 12 months ago to a whole load of German audiences that Greece and other countries would have to be bailed out with a combination of the European Union and the IMF, and people just laughed at me and they said, no, of course this won't happen. They said it's Britain that's going to need the IMF, uh, not the Italians and not the Greeks and not the Spanish. I even um, addressed a whole packed room of Germans in uh, Hamburg uh, in, in May last year, only 12 months ago, and the proposition was whether or not the euro would be irrevocable. And I had uh, 40 people uh, agreeing with me that it wouldn't be irrevocable, and I think 160 disagreeing, uh, um, and saying the euro would be forever. That was the view in Hamburg just 12 months ago, after I had debated with Klaus Hinch from the European Parliament for a couple of hours, I did actually get my majority up uh, from 40, my, my minority, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, from 40 to 80. So I doubled my score because I told the Germans, if you want this thing to be forever, you are going to have to pay for it. As it is now, though, the Greeks are going to have to reschedule their debts. Um, hopefully it will be in an orderly way. It will be after they've used up all the money from the public sector. They will have repaid the Mr Ackermans of this world using money from the taxpayers. And this is going to lead to a tremendous amount of irritation, to put it mildly, with the taxpayers of Europe. And the most likely time when the Greeks are going to have to restructure their debt is 2012, when it could be, with a great deal of effort, they will have got back into some kind of primary surplus, that is, a surplus not counting interest payments. That will be the time to restructure debt, when you've managed to actually reduce some of the huge hump of debt payments, but you will still have... Um, a great unmanageable wadge of debts to be repaid. So I predict that will happen. I also predict, though, that Greece can stay in the monetary union uh, after, it has, um, after it has restructured its debts. I don't think that this necessarily has to lead to the end of monetary union. It will, though, lead to a huge amount of ill feeling and resentment, particularly in the creditor nations which are standing part of this bill that is, of course, Germany, but also the Netherlands, don't forget that the Portuguese and the Irish and the Spanish are also contributing to the bailout for Greece. The big question will be whether in this next two to three years, the other countries in southern Europe, particularly Spain as the largest and possibly the most vulnerable country, whether that country itself does enough to put its house in order. I do think, though, that it's, it's impossible to say how this is going to end. So whether it's going to be the Germans killing off uh, the euro or the Greeks, I, I'm sorry to say that I, I, the jury is out on this. Thank you very much. Thank you.